pardon. For, as my lord said, a block of marble would feel compassion sooner than King James. Nay, hey, I'll make no speeches. Nay, I would say this. There has been a scandal raised upon me about a woman, a lady of virtue and honor. I will name her the Lady Henrietta Wentworth. I have committed no sin with her. What has passed between us was very honest and innocent in the sight of God. Now, Master Ketch, here be six guineas for you. If you do your work quick and well, my servant has six more to give. I have ended my prayers, so wait no longer. Wentworth died soon after from a broken heart, and in the West Country many more suffered. The King had gathered together a great army, which he increased by recruiting wild Irish and other Catholics. He doubted not that by this means he could bring in Popery and be an absolute monarch. As first, the Habeas Corpus Act, which allows traitors to go free on bail so that they may practice more treason. Secondly, I would have Parliament repeal the infamous Test Act. It is intolerable that any man should not have freedom to serve me as counsellor, even though he be a Catholic, or to command my armies, whatever his religion. Sir, you have the most loyal Parliament that King ever had, but they will not repeal those acts. If they will not, they shall meet no more. I have power to dispense with these measures, and if it be necessary, I shall use it. There are safeguards in the law, sir, that can prevent you. The law? I am above the law. You may be, sir, but I am not. Nor any other man here. Your Majesty will remember what you declared at your succession. These, sir, are the exact words. I am resolved to preserve this government, both in church and state, as it is by law established. If you hold not by that declaration, Your Majesty, no man of honor will be able to serve you. And now, damnation, gentlemen, what does it matter who serves His Majesty? as long as His Majesty be served. I, John, every man should have a refuge. Somewhere he may retire from politics and war. But of all such retreats, a garden is the best. I find it so. And a good house you built here. A very modest one, sir. Nay, I hate to see anybody build beyond his means, but that you will never do. When a man has suffered poverty, as I did when a boy... Well, do I know it. But look at you now. A glass of wine. I think you know. My coach waits, and I'm bound for the north. So it is true. You've left the government. The King and I parted company last night. Only moderately good friends. May I ask why? John, you know... I'm given the character of a trimmer. The great trimmer, sir. Aye, well, they mean to insult me, yet I take it as a compliment. Truly, sir. So you would counsel moderation? Aye, between the fanatics of one extreme and those of the other. If they won't listen as now, I remove myself until they do. Would you advise me to do the same? Do you desire it? <sighs> Often. Though I should lose all my places and near all my income, Indeed, for that reason, I asked to be allowed to command our regiments in Holland. But the king would not permit it. Is it conceivable that he'd put his best general into the hands of William? Yet, like all Protestants at court, I walk a narrow edge. You have the courage for it. Like it or no, this is no time for you to disembark. As for me, God's mercy, what's that? My wife and her mother. <laughs> what, do they hate each other? Nay, they're devoted. And if you 
cannot bridle your tongue, madam. I find someone who will do it for you. Ah, now, sir, let me tell you that I refuse to stay here any longer to be insulted. Your fine wife has just called me a nosy, interfering, pestilential old bitch. And I Madam, will... I should much like to know what you called her. Oh, my lord, I that do not... That would not, my lord. Such language, most improper for noble ears. Sir! My mother thinks of me still as ten years old and would whip me if she could. If your husband were not a besotted fool, he would whip you. Daily! Now, husband is now, not... now, truce, both of you. Here's my Lord Halifax come out of his way to pay you a compliment and... <laughs> and all we do is rail at one another like a pair of old fishwives. Madam, being told that you have a stout grandson, I came to wish you joy of him. The birth of an heir is a great event in any family. Truly, my Lord. And I, for one, am obliged to you. How does the boy? Very well. He has his... Father's temper, I'm thankful to say. Why, he hardly ever screams and so far curses me not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must go. And you, madam. And you, my lady. May we go again by the garden? With pleasure, sir. We'll have no daffodils yet at Rufford. In Yorkshire, our spring is a full three weeks behind you. Yeah. Monstrous! Oh, I'm stay, great. mother! Oh. My spleen is quite gone. And I'll scold you no more. Today. <laughs> oh. So King James continues to make great havoc among the Protestant councillors. Bishop Compton is dismissed and suspended from his see of London. Danby is gone and at last Rochester. Sunderland feared that he might change his religion to keep his office, as Sunderland himself has done though God knows the latter has no principles to change. But Rochester refused. The king drives on, replacing the justices, filling places in the army and the fleet with Catholic officers. Under him, Sunderland rules all. The princess of Denmark's two daughters are yet alive, though sickly. She still loves her husband as he does her, too often, maybe, for his own good for he has been very ill these last three weeks. And oh, whenever I wake you're beside was ever a man better cared for by his wife? George, I must tell you. But I... you're in black clothes. Well, not for me, my love. Now I'll be up tomorrow and out hunting a Wednesday. Assuredly you will. But you're mighty pretty in black. Must wear it often. I. Dearest, forgive me. It is near a month now since you were ill. And you were very near death. Indeed, I... the doctors told me you would die. And if you had, I should not have wished for life without you. But I prayed that you might live, and God heard me. If ever I forget God's kindness to me. But I shall not, no matter what grief He may send. So long as you are spared to comfort me. My love. Come, 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 sweetheart. No more tears. No, no, no. I grow stronger every minute. All I need is a good dinner, a pair of plump pigeons, or a partridge. Gruel and syllabub. Oh, damnation, no. A, a glass of, of, of canary to wash the partridge down. And then, uh, what say you to a mutton pasty or a beef stew? Will you dine with me today? Oh, God's blood, girl, but I'm hungry. Now I know you're better. Stay. And I'll command you some dinner. Uh, of a sort. A, a brace of trout, fresh grilled, with a glass of Rhenish. Or, oh, say, two glasses. Aye, your Rhenish is the proper wine for fish. Oh.
well, madam. Now, Sarah, you're not to be vexed. Dear Mistress Morley, did you tell him? I tried to. I did try. But he, he saw me in black and made a jest and pretended he was well and strong. And, and truly, he is much better, thank God. But you didn't tell him. I hadn't the heart to do so just to see him but, marry but again. God, madam, he must be told. But, and by you. Would you wish him to hear it from others? Oh. They'll be quick enough. And what then? What must it be now? I fear so. Very well. But he's asking for his dinner. I'll see to that. Thank you. You know, it is a strange thing. He seemed to be quite gone from me already. Though I loved them. But they were here for such a little while. And now we're left. Childless. I do sometimes think that God has cursed the Stuart women. Here's my poor sister. Fertile as a sturgeon, yet her children die, and the women who marry Stuarts are no better off. And look at Catherine. King Charles had a son by every strumpet he slept with, but she had none. As for my father, oh, he has a few bastards, I believe, good, healthy boys, like... like young Berwick by Arabella Churchill. But from his queen, nothing. All stillborn or babes that are dead in a month. And I... With no children after nine years and not like to have them now, do you not think that God has cursed us? A man I once spoke with, a doctor from Leiden, told me we were all too closely bred. That we should not marry our cousins. But who else should we marry? Commoners? It may come to that if we're to survive. <clears throat> but I too have news from England. So, pray sit down. Your father writes asking me to publish our support for him, yours and mine, in the repeal of the Test Act and this new declaration of indulgence. Have you answered him? With your approval. I shall tell him that we think these measures ill-advised, that we cannot agree anything prejudicial to the security of the Protestant religion. And I approve this answer. Mary. It is time that we spoke plainly, together. Despite our private differences, other matters are more important. If you say so. You are the heiress to three kingdoms, and I... Well, without me, the League against France would fall to pieces and Louis would gain all Europe. He may succeed even so. Unless England is our ally. But events there move towards a crisis. Your father has lost all his friends. And now he makes his pet Jesuit, Father Petre, a member of the Privy Council. This is losing all sense of reality. By every post I have letters begging me to go to England. With an army, if need be. But I am no Monmouth. I can wait the right moment. And if that moment should come, have you thought of your being queen? Why, yes, often. And have you thought of what I should be? Why, what should you be? Whatever you as queen should decide. By English law, you may confer any title and authority upon me. <coughs> or, or give me none at all. None at all. But as a wife, whatever is mine must belong to you. Not by the law. Well, then I shall abide by God's law. And whatever happens, you shall be the ruler. The husband is never to be obedient to the wife. I ask only that you follow your part of the commandment. Husbands, love your wives, as I shall look to mine. Wives, 
Obey your husbands in all things. Come in. Madam, sir, excuse me. Here are new dispatches from London. Brought by a sure hand. Well, what news? Such as you will not like. Three days from now, the Queen will publicly announce that she is with child. Truly, I know not what to think or say, so I'll be silent. But my sister will not be. She'll desire to be told all details about how this pregnancy goes on. And she has a right to know them. Oh, indeed. But I shall be expected to find them out. And as you know, the Queen and I, well, since she became so bigoted a papist, since she and my father have tried to convert me away from the faith that I love and the Anglican Church. So, damnation, you're not the good friends that you were. What say you, Churchill? I say, be patient and wait. The Queen may be mistaken. Ladies have been before now. But if not, she has six months to run, and anything may happen. And if at the last a child should be born, and it's a girl, why, then there's no harm done. The Princess Mary is still next to the throne, and you, madam, are where you were. The Protestant succession is secure. But if the Queen should have a son? Aye, if that should happen. But the Jesuits will rule us all. I think not. I think not. In the meantime, my advice is to pay the Queen what compliments are owing to her and wait upon events. Though there are others, some great men among them, who will not be so discreet. And so far, my lords, every word I have spoken is high treason. When the King's whim is the law, any opposition can be called treason. Do you imagine we don't know this? I desired you to understand before I go further. The very fact that you are here makes this a traitorous assembly. Mm -hmm. And any one of us here could betray you all. Aye, truly. Now we approached Nottingham. As Chancellor, he would carry great weight. He thought upon it and decided in conscience he could not join us. So he was told that we might have to shoot him uh, to preserve secrecy. Shoot Nottingham? My Lord Bishop, things have come to a fine pass. May I ask what he replied? He agreed that we might be well advised to do so. But offered his oath that, uh, that he would uh, hold his tongue. And since it was Nottingham, we agreed. I swore him myself. My Lord Bishop, I'm past the age of taking oaths and playing the romantic conspirator. Will you shoot me if <laughs> I no, join No, Lord, him? because whether you do, actively or no, we are satisfied that you, Rochester and Godolphin, agree with the ends we pursue. Uh, what are they? Our purpose is to bring over the Prince of Orange. What? State, state, listen. If the Prince should come over with sufficient force... Force? What force? Germans? Dutch? Sufficient only to secure him and us, while we, the Lords, the Commons, and by God, the people of England, make known to the King that he must govern according to the laws. That they must call a free Parliament, get rid of the damned Jesuits, maintain the Test Act, and breed up his son if he should have a son, as a true Protestant successor. These dreams. The fantasies of Cloud Cuckoo Ran. What? This, Stuart, does not concede or compromise. Press him, and he becomes more stubborn. Question his divine right to rule, and he'll think you insane. Hence, what you propose will end only in civil war. And the king has so arranged matters that he could fight a war with every chance of success. Now, I speak only for myself. You have judged me truly. All my sympathy is with your cause. But I will not consent to any course that might take us back to the blood and agony of 40 years ago. Oh. You, Rochester? Each of us here is rich privately to William. Oh, no, 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 gentlemen, no need to deny it. It's only common sense to cover every possibility. Why, well, I'll wager 50 guineas. Even Sunderland has written to him. No, <laughs> near certainty. Aye. For private letters of courtesy are one thing, and normal, while my niece Mary is next in succession. But a formal invitation to invade is another. I loathe popery like the devil, but I'll not join in such a plot. Halifax? I take my stand with Godolphin. He's a gamester who knows his odds to a hair. If he won't wager, I shall not. Still trimming? To the end. Nevertheless, though I think you're mistaken, I'll not betray you. Devonshire, Shrewsbury, and the rest should know this. You have my word. 
And mine. And mine. <laughs> <laughs> Now, truly, madam, when I was in Paris, these new patches were the rage. Small, do you see? And cut so very curiously. I have never yet patched, and I know not whether it becomes me to follow such fashions. Why, they were quite out for years, but now back again. Though not as coarsely as in the last reign. Do but try this one. A star, placed near the eye. Yes. Yes, I must agree, it does sit off the eyes. And at the lips on t'other side. Oops. So. <sighs> the effect is to draw attention to your prettiest features. Anne. Oh. See how my Lady Sunderland wheedles me into vanities. Harmless enough, I'm sure. Oh. Are you well today? I thank God, as well as I was yesterday, and as I expect to be tomorrow. I'm glad to hear you say so. And as I hope to be six weeks hence, when my child is born. Sarah, do you not think I look well? Indeed, madam, you do. You look fit to dance a measure with any gallant at court. I believe not. And I have more care for my belly than to think of such a thing. I should hope so. But you, Anne, you look pale. You should go to Bath. The waters there will do you so much good. Nay, hey, I have no... But I insist. I I've spoken to the king and he agrees. You shall go for the next month. And be home in time for my lying in. Mama. Sarah shall go with you, of course. Oh, of course, madam. There is something most fortunate about Bath. It was there the king met me last autumn. And all my present happiness is the result. Mm. I've heard this is often true of watering places such as Bath, Buxton, Tunbridge Wells, and other places of resort. Aye. Well. My Lady Sunderland, I should rest now. Pray ask the women to prepare my room. At once, madam. Do you carry the child high or low? Low. Very low. Well, the doctors do say this is best. Does he move greatly? I should much like to... Nay, I'll not be touched. Madam, I you thought... shall not touch me! Please, you shall not! Please. You shall not! Ah. Oh. <coughs> I'm ashamed. I am ashamed of her because this is the woman that once loved us. More, I'm ashamed of myself. Now, there is no need to be. You did only what your sister commanded. I'll do it no more. Why should the Queen use me so? Well, either because she's near her time and her nerves are wearing thin, or there may be another reason, but I'll not guess at that. Now, do we go to Bath? If my father insists, we must. You should have been with us in the West Country. Why, Monmouth is clean forgotten there. He offered them only rebellion and death. I promised them liberty of conscience. The dissenters rejoiced, and mark you, they are all Puritans and dissenters down there. Now, Sunderland, obtain for me a parliament filled with good Catholics and nonconformists, and we'll have no trouble in repealing the Test Acts and all the penal laws. Churchill, don't you agree? I believe if you were successful, sir, you would run into grave danger. How? Oh, how so? At Winchester, in the great church there, you touched many people for the king's evil. So I did. The people expect it of any king. But your manner of doing it, attended by Catholic priests, was not to their liking. Indeed. Sir, your people begin to be persuaded that you pave the way for the imposition of popery. The toleration is no more than a device, and the next step will be the destruction of all religion in this country except your own. Have I not given them my word? Do they doubt it? Do they not believe the word of their king? They look across at the misery of France since Louis revoked the Edict of Nantes and all men were forced to become Catholic. They see how barbarously the Huguenots are used and they dread the same here. Do you share this dread? I do not, but I fear something else and the duty I owe you compels me to express it. Well, then. No man in England would do more to purchase your affection, but I was bred a Protestant and I intend to live and die in that communion. sir. Nine parts in ten of the whole people are of the same persuasion. It was they who made the restoration. 
and supported the crown against Shaftesbury and the Republicans. They represent the genius of the English nation. They are your true friends. I doubt not your zeal for my service. But I tell you, Churchill, I will exercise my religion as I see fit. I will show favor to my Catholic subjects and I will be a common father to all my Protestants. But I am to remember that I am king and to be obeyed by them. As for the consequences, I leave them to Providence. see my labor. Save the midwife and you. Does your majesty agree to this? Aye. Let her have the privacy she desires. But remember, when the child is born, make me the sign I gave you. I shall. <laughs> this entertainment? Nay, I should have been, since neither of my nieces are present, Mary being in The Hague and Anne sent to Bath. Do you say this was by design? Well, question this. And now we have a premature confinement. By how much, do you know? Well, the Queen swears the doctors are wrong and she is full term. Hmm. God, that, what's that? Who ever heard of a woman in labour who needed a warming pad? Somebody should have looked into that. You don't think it suggests? That suggests nothing. But of all royal births, this is the most strange, not the least strange thing about it, is that warming pad. Blessing of Almighty God, the Queen is delivered of a son. And do you say the bed curtains were drawn? When? About half an hour before the birth. Who went inside? Lady Sunderland, certainly. What others, I know not. Was the child shown to the people there? Not once. About one hour later, we all saw a male child. One hour later? So that in that time... Now, what is all this about a warming pan? Oh, you uh, heard of that. We heard of nothing else on the road from Bath. Was a pan brought in? There was, but who could possibly believe Oh, believe it or not, every Protestant in England will swear a child was introduced. Is it possible? Is it possible? Now, Rochester made special note, I remember. Yes, this is Rochester's invention. Madam, whatever the circumstances, and they are suspicious, I will never agree that the Queen would consent to an imposture. Which is a papist, Sidney, and under the thumb of the Jesuits, not to speak of the King. She'd do whatever they told her was right. <laughs> she has a conscience. Aye, and it'll trouble her, I've no doubt. But she'll not lack confessors. And after confession comes penance and finally absolution. Oh, no, you go too fast, I think. One hour, you said. Time enough to substitute a live child for a dead one. Or for no child at all. But stay, though. My Lady Sunderland. She's a scheming, false, immoral creature, as all the world knows, but no papist. So if she was there and helped at the birth... Madam, excuse me, but I come from the King. His Majesty has heard of your return and desires to see you and the Prince at your convenience. If that means anything, it means now. Very well. 
Sarah, you go to Holywell tonight? And it please you, madam. My children have not seen, seen you these three weeks. <laughs> Kiss them for me. Will you go with us, my lord? Your children are well, though they've missed you. I too. Then you shall have the first kiss. John, as we came today towards Hounslow, past the army camp, we heard a great noise of cheering and shouting. I know. I was there myself with the king. They were cheering the king? Not so. There'll be no more cheering of this king. But yesterday, Sarah, the seven bishops went on trial and were acquitted. Were they indeed? And today, at the camp at Hounslow, the news of their acquittal reached the soldiers. These men, these ordinary men, cheered as if to burst their lungs. And James, as he was leaving, heard and asked for the reason. Some fool said, "'Tis nothing, Your Majesty. The men are glad that the bishops are acquitted." Good God! And what said His Majesty to that? He said, "'Do you call that nothing?' and spoke no more all the way to London. And now? We're approaching a crisis. It may not be for weeks or months, but I think it'll be soon. When it comes, your care will be for the Lady Anne and my dear soul, for yourself, since I shall not be with you. John. I'll tell you in good time what to do for your safety and hers. In the meantime, Sarah, God knows I've endeavoured to help the man. Warned him as best I can, tried to open his eyes, but he'll be guided only by fools and knaves and his own stubborn bigotry. Well, I've made my decision. What have you done? Committed myself wholly and in writing by my own hand to the Prince of Orange. Well? The news you wait for, sir. The French armies have moved south towards Cologne, so the Netherlands are safe until winter. Good. And our States General. This gives you their permission for the descent on England. At last. And here, Bentinck, here is my formal invitation from the great lords, Danby and the rest. They're bound to me now, and I shall hold them to it. No less valuable, a letter this day from Churchill, who rules the army. This I needed most of all. Since the last thing I wish is to fight a war, I must go to England not as a conqueror, but as a liberator. Now it can be done. We shall squeeze the king gently until he cracks. By a miracle, everything falls into my hands. It is now or never. So the Prince of Orange sailed with a great fleet at the end of October 1688. Though at first he was driven back by storms, he then had a fair breeze. Men called it a Protestant wind and he landed safe at Torbay. Like most others, I was innocent enough to believe that he came only to restore our freedom and had no thought to usurp the crown. The king gathered his army together. My lord and the Prince of Denmark went with him, though Feversham was commander-in-chief, and they advanced down to Salisbury. The Prince of Orange is at Axminster. And it is now clear that all the great men of Devonshire and Somerset have declared for him. The Earl of Bath has yielded up Plymouth, town, fortress, and troops. And that, sir, means... It means that William has no enemy in his rear. Aye, sir. From the north, what news? And nothing good. Delamere is at Manchester, Danby has seized York, and the Duke of Devonshire controls Nottingham. Oh, my God. It's just three days from London. Is it possible? Well, Feversham, what is your counsel? To withdraw. What? In good order, while we may. London must be protected. Kirk, you disagree. God's blood and bones, sir, I do. What's an army for except to fight? Besides, we outnumber them two to one. And if we fight, we can win. I believe, sir. Churchill, to withdraw would be the worst thing you can do. A free choice is open to you. None could be more disastrous. Wherefore? Because it smells of a defeat. Those who now await events will declare for the prince. Many will desert you. Huh. Three choices. What are the other two? One is political. Send word to William. Arrange a meeting while you still command an army in the field so you negotiate from strength. Negotiate? This you must do sooner or later. If not with William, then with the lords and common people of England. So make the prince your ally and not your enemy. A peaceful settlement could be reached now. 
but I think never again. We are here, my lord, to discuss military strategy, not politics. <clears throat> I am obliged to remind your majesty you have an alliance with France. My master will aid you if you seek his help, but he will not accept any accommodation with Orange. I need no reminders. Sunderland was dismissed for making the same proposal. Well, what is my third choice? Advance and meet the prince in battle. He will try and avoid it, for the last thing he desires is to shed blood on English soil. So you have him at a disadvantage. And I agree with General Kirk about your chance of success. Yeah. I've decided we shall withdraw. Churchill, order a general retreat to cover London. I shall go there tomorrow myself. Barry Young, you will accompany me. Feversham, remain here in command. Well, Beckett, horses. Aye, sir, in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Tomorrow. For one moment, I thought you'd persuade him. I did not. But I've done what any man could do. Tomorrow, then. Should I not go with you? No, sir. Never change a good plan unless you are forced to. I pray you, play your part as arranged. Oh, very well, very well. But hang me if I relish dining with the king. Why, he... How many are you? Four hundred, all told, sir. Troopers and officers mounted and ready. Right, gentlemen. We march to Axminster. Your Highness, here is my Lord Churchill. Feversham. Tonight I suffer what my brother did when Monmouth conspired to kill him. Matt, I heard that someone was here to see me, but not that it was you. You came alone? Because I must speak with you alone, and no one must ever know that I was here. Promise me. That I shall do, madam, when I know why you've come. Then I'll tell you. But it is a strange thing. But after all these years, you cannot trust me. Many changes in those years. Yet I owe you much, and I'm always grateful for it. Very well, I promise. What service do you desire of me? Nay, it is the other way about. I come to do you one. Have you heard yet that your husband has deserted the king? No. And gone over to the Prince of Orange? No, madam. That is, of course, a lie. Lord Churchill's messengers can ride as fast as the King's. But no matter. I should lie too, and it were me. As you may imagine, the King is deeply wounded and bitterly angry. He has sent post haste to order your immediate arrest. Then why am I not arrested? You should have been by now. But I persuaded them to wait until morning. Why? If my Lord has injured you, so why? Some things are hard to kill. It may be that my old friendship for you is one of them. I know not what to say. Farewell will do. You must be gone from here before daylight. I told you to be ready and uh, waiting. I'm so tired. I must have dozed a little. Jessie, I quick now. Down with you. See that all is prepared. Aye, madam. And I'm tell away. my Lord Bishop that uh, we'll only be um, five minutes. Captain. 
down quick. Aye. My lady, you go first. I'll bring the princess. Oh, my shoe! Drive on, coachman. Drive on. Oh, my God. What else remains? What can I do when even my children are forsaken? As for you, Father, make what haste you may out of this country. Mary, farewell. This gentleman, the Count de Lausanne, will travel with you and the child. Now, when I have word of your arrival... Oh, you will follow. Do you swear you'll come over? I swear it within two days. Enough time has been gained by sending the Dolphin and Halifax to William. Nobody will suspect a ruse while they discuss terms. But I'll not stay for a reply. No, you must not. <laughs> I'll let myself be trapped. He put me in the tower, and then... No king was ever sent there and allowed to live. <coughs> oh, but have no fears for me. I will come, and later I shall choose my own ground for battle. Your Majesty, everything is ready. I have a boat waiting at the privy steps. Oh, thank you, Bruce, thank you. Your kindness to us shall not be forgotten. My lord, I confide to you, my queen and my son. Everything must be risked to bring them safely to France. Go now, and God go with you. Majesty. In my country, sire, we know how to behave ourselves towards a king. 